In the last three decades, a remarkable change has transformed the face of the world's most populous country. The figures are mind-boggling. Since 1980, China's gross domestic product has increased by over 3,000%, from 300 billion to over 10 trillion. This boom has been fueled by the remarkable rise of China's manufacturing sector, symbolized by the ubiquitous Made in China mark on seemingly every factory-made product. In 1988, China's global trade was valued at 200 billion. Today, it is worth over 4 trillion. This has led to a now familiar narrative. From a primarily poor and agrarian country, China is now increasingly urban, with a burgeoning middle class enabled by the Chinese Communist Party's relaxation of rules on private capital. This, we are told repeatedly, has led to more people being lifted out of poverty than ever before in the history of the world. China is honoring former leader Deng Xiaoping for engineering the country's rapid economic growth. Chen Wei Xiao is from Deng's home province of Sichuan. He says Deng's economic reforms made life better for ordinary Chinese. We're eating well and we have nice clothes to wear. It's a well-off society. Everything is good. I'm very happy. Chen was a tourist in the southern city Shenzhen. The city was China's first special economic zone, which offered preferential treatment for foreign investors and exporters wanting to cash in on the country's cheap labor. The thing that they've done over the past three decades is is lifting hundreds of millions of people out of poverty, you know, and I think that that's, that's a good achievement. In the past 10 years, there's been more attempt to secure the interests of disadvantaged people and, and, of, and of relatively poor people in, in, in the countryside. As compelling as this narrative is, it does not tell the whole story. While no one can deny that the country as a whole is significantly wealthier than it was three decades ago, the masses of poor itinerant workers remain largely impoverished, dividing their lives between long hours in sweatshop-like factories and restless nights in squalid, overcrowded company dormitories. For the time being, China's most significant contribution to the global economy remains cheap, reliable labor. Anyone who's ever worked an assembly line can tell you about the pressure and the boredom and the fatigue. Conditions in the factories have often been harsh. Poor safety, illegally long working hours, cramped accommodation, few breaks and little leave. An undercover investigation into the world's largest electronics company, Samsung, by the human rights organization China Labor Watch, has revealed that abuse of workers is rife in factories either owned by Samsung or in those that make parts for Samsung products. Eight factories were investigated, including six directly operated by Samsung and two supplier plants by spies posing as workers or interviewing workers. They found forced and excessive child labor, excessive overtime, exhausting working conditions and widespread verbal and physical abuse. This story, the story of the brutal conditions that make the world's cheap plastic products possible and the desperation of the workers who make them, has threatened to burst through the bubble of first-world ignorance before. In 2012, the issue of the suicide problem at electronics manufacturer Foxconn, with over 1 million employees across China and 400,000 in Shenzhen alone, became headline news when it was brought to the public's attention by Mike Daisy and his one-man show, The Agony and the Ecstasy of Steve Jobs, which detailed his experience traveling to Shenzhen with an interpreter and interviewing the company's workers. In my first two hours, of my first day at that gate, I met workers who were 14 years old. I met workers who were 13 years old. I met workers who were 12. Do you really think Apple doesn't know? When Daisy's story was eventually found to contain errors and fabrications, the issue of Foxconn's treatment of its workers disappeared from the news cycle. But the reality underlying that story, a reality of long hours and poor pay and suicide nets, disappeared with it. The suicide nets went up in the spring of 2010 when nine Foxconn workers jumped to their deaths in the span of three months. A total of 18 employees took their own lives or tried to in recent years. Some striking news. An employee of Foxconn Technology Group attempted to kill himself by cutting his veins Thursday in South China's Shenzhen City. He survived 
after medical treatment. Well, the suicide attempt came after 12 Foxconn employees had tried to end their lives, and 10 had succeeded by falling from buildings so far this year. A tragic state of affairs, and in response, Foxconn has taken action to ensure the mental health of their employees by making them sign a pledge vowing not to kill themselves. <laughs> done and done. While the average worker building electronics in the U.S. today makes over $23 an hour and works 41 hours a week, most of the people at Foxconn earn just over $2 an hour and strive for a 60-hour work week. Shifts have overtime built in, so workers regularly do more than 60 hours a week, more than Apple's guidelines. So if the workers at the bottom of China's economic miracle have seen very little of the benefits of that miracle, the question is, who has? The answer, perhaps unsurprisingly, is that a small group of families, all related to a small cadre of politicians and bureaucrats surrounding Chinese leader Deng Xiaoping during the country's transition out of Maoism in the 1970s, have reaped the lion's share of this new wealth. And they did so by cutting a deal with the corporate, financial, and banking elite of America, who were searching for a way to move the U.S. manufacturing base offshore. In order to understand this part of the story, we must first understand the history of China to know that this is not the first time the country was colonized to serve wealthy foreign interests. In the 18th century, Europeans developed a taste for various Chinese goods, including silk, tea, and porcelain. The trade for these goods was largely one way. China was not so interested in European goods. As a result, more and more of Europe's silver bullion found its way into China and stayed there. To correct this trade imbalance, the British East India Company hit upon a Machiavellian solution. It used intermediaries in Turkey and India to smuggle opium into China, where opium dens became commonplace and the effects of opium addiction ravaged the Chinese countryside. By 1838, as many as 12 million addicts populated the opium dens, many idle and unemployed, some selling their family into slavery to afford their habit. When Chinese Special Imperial Commissioner Lin Zixu was dispatched to Canton, now modern-day Guangzhou, to stop the opium trade, the British responded by sending warships and expeditionary forces to wreak havoc on Chinese ports and coastal cities. This, the first opium war, led to a decisive British victory and the Treaty of Nanjing, which ceded Hong Kong to the British, as well as forcing open five major port cities to British trade, including Guangzhou, Jiamen, Fuzhou, Ningbo, and Shanghai. This began an era that Chinese nationalists later called the Century of Humiliation. The Qing Dynasty had itself been humiliated, and unequal treaties like the Treaty of Nanjing undermined traditional Chinese trade restrictions, foreign relations, and even the country's legal system. China had become yet another outpost of the British Empire, still autonomous, but as integral to Britain's trade interests as any of its colonies. With the Communist Revolution of 1949, China once again retreated into its Middle Kingdom status, severing its diplomatic and economic ties to Britain, the United States, and the other Western powers that had long held such power over it. As Professor Michel Chosodowski of the Center for Research on Globalization explains, however, those ties were to be formed once again, less than three decades later. So 1972 is a landmark date. 1976 um, is uh, the major landmark date for the transition. Xu Enlai dies in, in um, early 76. Um, he was very much a go between the, the two factions within the Communist Party, the left and the right, the, the capitalist rotors, and so on. Uh, and then Mao Tse Tung uh, passes in September. And immediately after the death of Mao Tse Tung, there is um, a regime change um, where the, the so called Gang of Four but they were depicted as the Gang of Four, the four major leaders of the, uh, within the state apparatus uh, were, uh, were in effect displaced and arrested and demonized. And in fact, these were supporters of Mao Zedong. This coup could not have, been, have taken place while Mao Zedong was still alive. And the Western media celebrated, uh, pretty much uh, reverberated the, the position of, of, the, of the Communist Party, the Chinese Communist Party. And then there was a period of transition with, uh, 
with a new leader, Hua Guofeng, um, which lasted approximately, well, of about a year to two years. And Deng Xiaoping made his comeback in 77, 78. And in 1978, they established the free trade zones, uh, which was very crucial. And subsequently, of course, in 1979, Deng Xiaoping travels to America and, um, and also uh, makes the statement or expresses his, his anti-Soviet position. And he said, how do we tame the polar bear, so to speak? And, um, and then in the early 80s, uh, you had some important landmark uh, decisions. One was, I, I think, 83 was the, the new Chinese constitution, which abolishes the people's commune, which uh, ultimately was still it, it, how they, they managed to inscribe economic policies within the constitution is quite, you know, quite unusual in, in some regards. And then in the, in the following year, uh, in 84, they, they, extend the, they extend the special economic zones to much broader areas in what were formerly the, the treaty ports of the colonial or the semi-colonial period. Now, that is, of course, very important because what they were restoring and in the same, of course, in the same cities, of, uh, we're talking about Tianjin, Guangzhou, uh, Shanghai, of course, um, and they, what they do is they, re they restore areas where foreign, foreign companies can come in and invest um, it's much more directed towards um, broader industrialization, technology. Uh, uh, it's not limited s simply to, to assembly line type of operations. But that was, of course, very crucial. Now, I, I, should, I should make a flashback to, to the 19th century because in, in the wake of the Opium Wars, which started in 1839, um, which, well, without getting into the complexities of this war, there was a treaty, and there were subsequent treaties. The, 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 the Treaty of Nanjing is, is 1842, which opens up China to Western uh, uh, merchants and investment and so on, including, uh, and then subsequently railways, um, public infrastructure and so on, and, and puts China's trade under under the control of the colonizers, uh, in, in particular Britain, and in, in, uh, controlled the customs. Now, uh, that particular structure was used as a model to restore the, the relationship to foreign capital in the wake uh, of, um, uh, let's say, in, in the wake of, uh, of Mao's death, what we might describe as the post-Mao era. And... Uh, uh, they use, in fact, the same terms, the open door policy. Now, the open door policy is an American concept, which was part of a treaty. It's the Treaty of Wanxia, which was signed shortly after the Treaty of Nanjing. And so there they reinstate, um, they reinstate um, the structures of trade which prevailed uh, prior to 1949. The ringleaders of this transition are known in China as the Eight Immortals. Communist Party members who rose to prominence after the death of Mao Zedong in 1976 and centering on Deng Xiaoping, who survived a party purge during Mao's reign and took over leadership of the country in 1978. These eight figures oversaw the opening up of the Chinese economy to Western financial and business interests, including a June 1980 meeting of Rong Yi Ren, chairman of then newly established state investment firm Citic and David Rockefeller in Chase Manhattan's Wall Street headquarters. The meeting, attended by the chief executives of nearly 300 corporations, charted a course for economic and technical cooperation between the economies of China and the U.S. In the following years, scores of Fortune 500 companies established headquarters in Beijing's new Central Business District, and foreign direct investment in China increased from almost nothing at the time of the transition in the late 1970s to $128 billion last year making the country now the top destination for foreign direct investment in the world. As a result, the descendants of the eight immortals now enjoy immense personal wealth and largely maintain the role of stewards of the Chinese economy. 
A 2012 Bloomberg special investigation examined 103 descendants and spouses of these immortals, finding that the families have diversified from control of state-run conglomerates into real estate development, private equity, and technology. 26 of those descendants, known as the Princelings, ran important state-owned companies or held top positions in them, with three of the most important heading or running companies with access to $1.6 trillion in capital. The almost unimaginable wealth of these elite families stands in stark contrast to the lives of the itinerant factory sweatshop workers in their company dormitories, and even sharper contrast to the party's officially espoused ideals about equality in the People's Democratic Republic of China. The contrast between this ruling class and the average Chinese worker is not lost on the Chinese themselves. Although the Eight Immortals are still revered as founders of the modern nation, there is growing resentment of the extremely wealthy princelings and their command over the lion's share of the economy. There is also a growing nationalist sentiment that are eager to see the country assert itself on the international stage, in defiance of the American paymasters who made the transition possible. Professor Michel Chosodovsky notes this tension within the Chinese leadership's own ranks. China is, in some regards, uh, an industrial colony. I use that quote-unquote, uh, but at the same time, it is an upcoming um, power uh, on, the, on the global stage. And I should mention that that uh, emerged also um, in the wake of the post cold in the wake of the Cold War, um, where China's alignments vis-a-vis, uh, -vis, particularly vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the Russian Federation, had changed dramatically to what they were in in the you know during the Cold War era, uh, and in, in the late nineties, particularly in the wake of of the death of of uh, Deng Xiaoping and the demise of of um, of uh, and the change of the change of government in 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 the Russian Federation. Uh, in other words, uh, when when uh, Vladimir Putin became uh, president, uh, there we have a, a, a consolidation of of of, uh, of an alliance between the Russian Federation and the People's Republic of China, the development of the Shanghai Cooperation Agreement, and so on and so forth, and. Another very important dimension in in the in the late nineties, ironically, just after Deng Xiaoping uh, passed, uh, there is um, there is an increased confrontation in the Taiwan Straits. Of course, there was always confrontation in the Taiwan Straits, but then it was at that point that China. Uh, um, developed its military cooperation agreements with Russia um, and uh, started to build up a naval, naval facilities in the South China Sea to counteract U.S. threats. Uh, and, uh, and then, of course, we had a very major shift in geopolitical relations, I would say, uh, as of the late 90s, early uh, 2000, early 21st century. Um, which is increasingly towards confrontation between China and the United States. But I, I, sh I should uh, qualify that because when you go to China, you have a very pro-American uh, um, intelligentsia, the people, uh, peoples in, in the universities and so on, um, the, the School of Journalism uh, of Tsinghua University, uh, is uh, supported by Bloomberg. Uh, people at the Academy of Social Sciences uh, uh, are very much tied into to Western values and so on and so forth. Uh, so that, in fact, I would say the leadership is profoundly, is very much divided. Um, America is very much, is very visible. Western capital is very visible throughout China. But at the same time, um, it, uh, it, it's more at the political, geopolitical level that there's confrontation. And I think that the Chinese say, well, we're a capitalist economy in our own right. We're not going to be a subordinate colony of the West. Uh, but, but if you look at the actual mechanics of, of foreign trade, they still are because they're producing commodities 
um, for the world market, and they are sort of feeding the non-productive structures of Western capitalism. The growing tensions in the South China Sea and the Asia-Pacific generally are real. They are palpable, and they are impossible to miss. The world is being prepped for a confrontation of some sort between the world's superpower and its growing rival in the East. But this confrontation, like every major world conflict before it, is largely bankrolled and even encouraged by the financiers and businessmen on both sides who cooperate with each other. For the time being, China continues its role as America's neocolonial outpost, a manufacturer of the cheap products that the U.S. increasingly relies on and a willing recipient of the U.S. Federal Reserve notes and treasuries that represent the paper promises of the current world economic order. The only question is how long this relationship will last and what it will look like when it ends. For more on this story and other breaking news and current events, please go to globalresearch.ca. For more research and analysis by James Corbett, please go to corbettreport.com.